if I may take just a moment of personal privilege to express to you all my deep appreciation for the privilege of having worshipped with you and led you in worship for the last three Sundays and this Sunday as well. It really has been a joy for me to be with you. Um, you are a great group of people. You are a fine congregation. It is clear that you love and respect each other and that you are about the Lord's work in this place. It has been a, a privilege for me to be a part of that. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, calm our minds and speak to us your truth. Enable us to hear good news. Empower us to serve. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today is taken from Psalm 147. It's verses 1 to 11 and verse 20. Hear the word of God. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem and gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and gives all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden and he casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with cloud, clouds and prepares rain for the earth. Makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse nor in the pleasure in speed of a runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him in those who hope in his steadfast love. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his ordinances. Praise the Lord. And our New Testament lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark. We're still in the first chapter of Mark, verses 29 to 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him, and when they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. And he answered, let us go. Let us go on to the neighboring town so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to, out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Well, we are still in the early days of Jesus' public ministry in our text today. If you remember last week, Jesus and his four disciples had entered the synagogue on the Sabbath where he taught with authority, the text said, and healed the man with demon possession. Today's text follows right on the heels of that healing, yet with another miracle, the healing of Simon's mother-in-law. So early on in his gospel, Mark gives us two miracle stories back to back. The first is the demon possession, and the second is a fever. One <clears throat> is in the synagogue, and the second is in the home of Simon and his brother Andrew, intimate disciples of Jesus. One miracle involves healing a man, 
and the other miracle involves healing a woman. So in these two stories early on in the gospel, we learn that Jesus heals all sorts of maladies in all kinds of environments for all kinds of people. In our passage today, we have healing, exorcism, service, prayer, and proclamation. Now that's a lot for just 10 sentences. But remember, Mark is a storyteller of action. He is showing us Jesus on the move. And our lesson today, he certainly lives up to that reputation. Jesus and his disciples leave the synagogue and go to Simon's house and there discover Simon's mother-in-law is sick. She has a fever. And in those days, fever was often fatal. So she was near death. Jesus goes to her. He takes her hand and lifts her up. In touching her, Jesus reaches across religious and social boundaries of the day to bring about her healing. You see, he touched a woman that was not a member of his family and a woman who was ill and therefore considered ritually unclean. So in just three short sentences, Jesus has managed to cross religious, social, and gender boundaries. We see the power of God in these few verses, the power of God that moves in unexpected directions. In our text, it says he raised her up. The word that Mark used for raised or lifted up is the same Greek word used on Easter morning when the women are at the tomb and they are told he is not here, he is risen. It's the same word used for raised up when Jesus was lifted up on the cross. Jesus took Simon's mother-in-law by his hand and raised her up to new life. And what does she do? Immediately, she begins to minister to those around her. She is the first active witness to what resurrected life in Jesus looks like. Friends, at baptism, we too are raised to new life in Christ, to a life of service to others around us, those we know, and even those in the crowd whose names we cannot call. Biblical, biblical scholar Lamar Williamson points out her response to the healing of Jesus is discipleship of lowly service, a model to which Jesus will repeatedly call his followers throughout this gospel and which he will supremely embody in his own service. This is the first series first in a series of incidents, Williamson says, in which a woman represents a right response of discipleship in Mark's gospel. The poor widow, the woman with the ointment, the women at the cross, and the women at the tomb demonstrate discipleship of service to which we are all called. Our text goes on to tell us that by sundown, a crowd had gathered around Simon's house. Now, word had spread about this Jesus who commanded the demons and lifted people from dear, near death to life. People gathered from all over town. In the Gospel of Mark, the crowd or the crowds that gather around Jesus remind us of humankind and the multiplicity of needs that the human family brings to him in desperation and hope. His response of healing and compassion to the crowd assures us of the compassion and healing that Jesus extends to us. We do know that Jesus was healing people into the night, but our text does not tell us how long that went on. And it does tell us that right before sunrise, he got up and went out to a lonely place to pray. Now, this lonely place is a deserted place, a wilderness place, if you will. Here we get a glimpse of Jesus' own rhythm of work and rest and prayer. The Gospel writer refers to the lonely place with the same language he used to describe the wilderness of Jesus' temptations. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus prays often and alone, revealing his full humanity. 
in times of stress, temptation, questions, and decisions, Jesus turns to God in prayer for strength and guidance. Seeking conformity to God's will is Jesus' primary mission, and prayer keeps him in communion with God and God's will. It is only after time and prayer and discernment that Jesus is clear about his mission to proclaim the good news of God. Now, just a few weeks ago, we talked about Jesus' mission. He states it in verse 14 of the first chapter of Mark when he says, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And in our text today, he tells the disciples that they must move on to the next town and the next town and the next town so that he can deliver this good news there too to everyone. Our text says he went throughout Galilee proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Proclaiming the nearness of God's kingdom is Jesus' task. Jesus not only proclaims it, Jesus embodies the kingdom of God for all who come to know him. Teaching, healing, casting out demons, praying are all ways in which the presence of Jesus embodies the kingdom of God. His faith, his prayer, and his obedience to his divine commission are all ways that Jesus shows us what it looks like to be a disciple. Beloved of God, this world is hungry for healing, hungry for the kindness of human touch, for the whisper of assurance, for the intimacy of presence. The touch of a hand can heal, restore life, and exorcise our demons as well. Michelangelo used that powerful image of life-giving touch when he pictured creation as God reaching out, reaching out a hand to touch Adam, offering Adam life. We have been known to say that Christians are the hands and feet of Jesus in the world today. So I would ask, how do our hands serve as instruments of healing to help others be raised to new life? Simon's mother-in-law gets up and serves a meal. Food and feasting and the heavenly banquet are central images in the healed creation. The Good Samaritan in, ensures that the robbery victim he lifts up and takes to, the, to an inn is provided with food and drink for healing. The father of the prodigal son provides a feast for his son upon his return. And the resurrected Jesus shares breakfast on the beach with his grieving, dispirited disciples. You and I have an abundant opportunity to feed the hungry. Through soup kitchens, Super Bowl Sunday, your involvement in food production and distribution, school food programs, and your work with partner churches in Guatemala. You have a plethora of opportunities to bring healing of heart and healing of mind to others as you visit a loved one in the hospital, offer a phone call to a check in on a neighbor, send a card to a homebound member, and offer a prayer for one who lingers in illness. I believe that you are offering healing and hope to each other as you gather for your monthly fellowship dinners after worship. You feed each other with joy and friendship and the nourishment of your best offering as you bring your special dish recipes to that banquet table. I believe you extend a healing touch to each other as you reach out and clasp hands at the end of each worship service. You feel the energy of the one whose hands you hold and share your own life energy with the one on your right and the one on your left. You feel the warmth of that touch. You know whether that hand is large or diminutive. You can feel whether it is smooth or calloused with labor. You know if it's tight with youth or wrinkled 
with life's challenges. And I would venture to say, with a congregation that knows each other as well as you do, you are probably able even to glimpse the heart's deepest desire of the one whose hand you hold. And if you don't know the person well, you may rest assured that we all long for restoration and to be lifted to new life. My friends, you may be very confident that indeed significant things happen in heaven when the people of God pray on earth. So as you hold those hands in a few minutes, I would ask that you would commit to pray for the one or the ones whose hands you hold. Pray for each of them as you know them. Pray for them as the children of God they are. Pray for restoration and healing. Pray for them to know the presence of God in their own lives in new and meaningful kinds of ways. Pray for them to know God's will for their lives this week and in the years to come. Pray for them again and again. Beloved of God, we are not abandoned to the chaos of the world. We're not abandoned to the demons that surround us. We're not abandoned to the fear, fever that would claim our very lives. No. God has come to us in Jesus Christ. In the baptism of our lives, we have been touched and raised up. We are the recipients of divine attention. We are not abandoned. We know that we're the recipients of divine attention because Jesus has walked among us healing and casting out demons and praying and proclaiming that even now, even today, the kingdom of God is at hand. Thanks be to God.